you are watching us from. Maybe good morning. I'm not sure what time it is. But for those who are here in this auditorium in Kenya, good evening. Your music at this choir reminds me of my time at Rongo camp meeting some years ago when I met the Angaza, uh, is it choir or singers? Um, did they come from Kisumu? I'm not sure, but we had a wonderful time. Uh, the song that you sang um, as I sat there, the first song and then this one, I mean, I was even thinking, why don't we just uh, enjoy ourselves instead of me mounting or going to the pulpit to, to, to preach? I mean, you sounded so sweet. Beautiful music. Beautiful, lovely, lovely music. I, I wish you could sing again at the end of uh, my presentation. It was very, very beautiful. And maybe since I, I am in charge of uh, the pulpit right now, uh, I'm going to ask you to sing when, I, when I'm done. At least, uh, uh, you know, my pastor uh, can only uh, get his power back when I am done. So uh, between that time and now, I can manipulate the system. So it has very, very beautiful singing, and I praise God for your ministry. Um, you know, generally, congregations uh, such as yours are not known, you know, to sing, you know, sweet African music like that. I'm, and I'm very, very happy. We need to be proud as Africans. We need to. Um, tonight, I would like to share a message I am excited about. Yesterday, I did promise that I will speak on the subject, living the abundant life. And I want us to turn our attention to the book of First Kings, chapter 17. And we will pick the story from verse 2. And reading from the New King James Version, the Bible says, then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, and turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. What a beautiful story. The key person in this story is a man called Elijah, a prophet who uh, did his ministry in the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of wicked king Ahab. What has happened is that Elijah has uh, just 
been to see the king. He has confronted the king and he has told the king that there shall not be due no rain these years except at my word. And having said this boldly before the king, you know when God is your portion, you stand and you know that God is behind you. You have the courage to proclaim the oracles of God. You have the courage to say things as they are. Uh, but now, when he says this, and uh, the shocked king who doesn't know what to do, Elijah disappears. And as he disappears, God commands him. Now, notice how this story again begins. It says, then the word of the Lord came to him saying um, many things that we do in this life. I wish it could be said that there was something that inspired us and that inspiration came straight from God. I'm going to tell you for a fact that anything that we do for which we cannot see the hand of God in it is bound to fail. And so for me, I have determined that generally speaking in life, especially when it comes to huge matters, that I'm not going to start a project without first of all finding out whether this is what God wants me to do. The word of the Lord came. That word of the Lord that came was specific. Elijah, here where you are right now, is not the place where you should be. You need to go to a place I will show you. This is almost like us reading the book of Genesis in chapter 12 when God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, even though for the past 70 years you've lived in this city of Urim, I want you to move to a place I will show you. There are people today who live in Nairobi who perhaps should be in Nakuru. People who live in Nakuru who perhaps should be in Eldoret. People who live in Mombasa who perhaps should not be there. The only way you can begin to enjoy life and to find fulfillment as a child of God is to be where God wants you to be. Unfortunately, the majority of God's people do things purely from instinct or the fact that this is how I feel. You will never find fulfillment in this life if you don't take the time to find out from God where God himself wants you to be. When he created you, he understood where you could be. He understood where you must be. He understood what you must be doing when he put you here. Now, you remember a few days ago we referred to a text in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 and again notice the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, long before you appeared, I saw you in your mother's womb. Not only did I see you, but I also had a plan for you. Something I want you to be doing. A prophet to the nations. You cannot be happy, my dear friends, if you don't settle this particular question and you simply allow yourself to pass through life 
without settling this question. I told you how there are people who are nurses who are not supposed to be nurses. Police officers who perhaps are supposed to be pastors. God knows where we must be at which point. And for me, I am so happy. I told you that this particular meeting, I am not the one who was supposed to be here. A friend of mine simply called me and said, you know, I don't have the time to be there. Can you be there? And I checked my schedule and I discovered I had some free time. And after I discovered that I had some free time, then I understood that for the next three weeks, the place where God wants me to be is in Nairobi. So when I am here, I am so comfortable because I know God wants me to be here. He will give me all the protection there is to give. And like I said, while I am here, I am invincible until God says otherwise. There is no power that can destroy me while I am here. Unless God himself simply steps in and says, one son. I think otherwise. We need to be where God wants us to be. And in determining where God wants us to be, we must not always just look at the, the business interests. I am in this place because I can make money. Life is more than money. When God speaks to Elijah and he says, I want you to leave this place, he sends him to a place in the bush of all places. Now one would have thought that God Almighty, with whom nothing is impossible, should have found a better place for his servant to be. But he pushes him to the bush. Where does God want you to be? What does God want you to be doing? When those questions are answered, you will find fulfillment in this life. So to begin with, as we look at this particular story, we see once again that its genesis is God himself. Not, 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 not Elijah. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, again you see the individual aspect when God speaks. The individual aspect when God speaks. There are many people who think, well, I, I am just alone. I am just a woman. There is nothing I can do. I am just a young person. It has nothing to do with whether you are young or big, whether you are small. It has nothing to do with whether you are male or female everything to do with the fact that if God is in it, it doesn't matter who you are. One person, I, I like to put it this way, one person plus God is the majority. So I, I can be all out here and you think I am alone. No. One individual plus God is the majority. And the power in just one person, one individual, only God can see, you know, how one life can be so powerful, how one life can have so far-reaching results Results that reach into eternity. At the point when God was calling Elijah, Elijah had absolutely no idea that this particular story, thousands of years from that point into the future, at some point, this would be a story that would be used to inspire people. 
He had no idea, absolutely. So please, don't think you are unimportant. Don't think that by yourself, you're not important. You know, when Christ came, I like how Ellen White puts it, that even if it had been one person, he would have come. Even if it would have been just one person. So God speaks to one person. And the results are going to be eternal results. The word of God. Let me talk about the word of God and how important it is. For us as his children. The word of God. How important it is. Jesus at one point makes a powerful statement as he speaks to the Jews. The people who liked to argue with him. In John chapter 6. Verse 63, Jesus says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. That's how he puts it. Now, if, if you go to that particular Bible text, there's a portion, but go to the last portion of that particular Bible text. Jesus says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And this is the reason, one reason why you must not say, I wish I lived at the time Jesus lived on earth. Then I would have been one of the beneficiaries. No, my dear friends, God's word is living and active, according to Hebrews 4, verse 12. God's word is living and active. It's powerful. It's powerful. Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus says, as he concludes the Sermon on the Mountain, he says... Matthew 7, verse 24, the one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. I want to talk about how valuable the word of God is, how powerful the word of God is. School has just closed. We are on recess. And... Uh, as a lecturer at Toulouse University, which is in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, I have to travel to Lusaka, Zambia, a distance of more than 400 kilometers. And as I set off, I don't know how it will be when coming back because I don't have any money. I told you how the situation in Zimbabwe was so bad, economically speaking. And so I jump in my vehicle. I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen at the point when it will be time for me to return. I jump there, and I'm reminded of the words of of, 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 of David in Psalm number 23 when he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not, I shall not be in want. Oh, I shall not want. And I jump in and I want to stand on those powerful words of God. I keep driving. I am just alone. And as I keep driving, 
time and again, the tempter throws a word of doubt. He says to me, we will see what will become of you, how stranded you will be when you get to Lusaka. And, you know, then I remind myself, I go back to that same Bible text, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I was just alone. And I was saying this at the top of my voice. I wanted to challenge Satan. And I continued on this trajectory until I reached Lusaka. It didn't take long while I was in Lusaka. I got a phone call from the office, the union office there in Lusaka. And they were calling me. There was a message that had come to the people that worked in treasury. I got there and uh, they simply said, well, there's an email that we received from one of uh, the treasury people uh, in Harare. I'd been working at that time as a communications director for the Eastern Africa Division before I moved to Sulus University to teach. So in that email, the person who wrote it said, when you went to Solusi to teach, we forgot to give you some money. We have asked the union there in Lusaka to give you the equivalence of 1,500 US dollars. The Lord is a shepherd. I was preaching at a congregation in Lusaka. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to illustrate the point one of the congregations there. And I'm talking about the power of God. And I use the illustration of a little bird. When that little bird takes off, it does not take off like the helicopter does. Where once, you know, that thing begins to go around the dust and everything. That little bird will simply take off. And as it takes off, sometimes... It will not even be flapping its wings. It will just be moving, gliding through the air seamlessly, beautifully. I'm talking about the power of God. I'm, 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 I'm illustrating a point and I am saying, you know, how God takes care of, you know, little things such as this little bird which were not created in the image of God. Jesus himself says, now, you one, sir, you know, when you look at your hair, since you keep your hair, God has even numbered every single one of them. You can count on me. Then I tell the people, I'm going to stand on this particular promise of God. I had a child at Hildebeck College in South Africa. She graduated from here, Maxwell, then she went to that place there. I was owing the school 67,000 rand. And that's a lot of money. And so the people there told me, we will not enroll her until this bill is settled. 67,000, it's quite a lot of money. And I'm thinking... I can't go to a bank because banks are thieving institutions. I can't go to the bank. But there's a place where I can go. I will go straight to God. And I went to God and I said, Lord, I don't have any capacity to father people. I can't bring any person in this life. It's beyond me. It's beyond my capacity. It is you who brought this child into this world. And it would be pointless that where she has reached, you could decide to abandon her in the midst of nowhere. I'm leaving this issue to you. I'm giving this illustration and I'm saying to the people in that church that this particular issue, I have given it to God and I have no doubt sooner than later, God will come through for me. And I leave it there. The service is over. And then we are out, we're greeting people. And one young man comes to me. He was not even wearing a suit. He didn't even have a tie. 
He comes to me and says, now, pastor, that thing you are talking about, have you settled that amount? I said, no, 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 no. What I said is that God in his own time, he will settle that amount for me. And he says, pastor, I want you to come to my office because I want to settle that bill. Mm, this guy, did he hear me right? Maybe he thought I said 6,500 rands. I said 65,000. This is a guy says, come to the office and uh, gave me directions. On Monday, I went there. We greeted. It didn't take long. He picked his phone and phoned some guy at some bank and he said, uh, you know, from that particular account, I would like to transfer some money to South Africa in the amount of 65,000 rands. And I'm thinking, mm, this guy, we go to that bank and in the twinkling of an eye, everything is done. My dear friends, the Lord is my shepherd. My dear friends, when God says, when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33, do not be anxious about what you are to eat. You can stand on that word of God. Oh, the words of Jesus when he says in, in John 6, verse 63, the words that I speak to you are, 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 are spirit and they are life. But you see, the unfortunate thing is that God's people don't read the word of God. They don't. You will not benefit from something you don't know. God's people don't read the word of God. I want to give it to you through illustrations. The word of God is so powerful. We used to live in Harare. I had a trip to Nairobi, Kenya. But there were no flights to Nairobi. The time I wanted to fly. So I decided to drive with a friend of my ex. Again, you know, Pastor Mansa who conducted something here. So he was driving to Lusaka. So we went together. I said, you know, maybe I can catch a flight from Lusaka to Nairobi. It was a Friday. And on Friday, we get to Lusaka. In the evening, I get a phone call from my wife back in Harare. That Moape, my sister, had died. Now, this is a girl we had gone to see two weeks ago. We had driven all the way from Harare to Lusaka and all the way to, you know, where my dad used to live. So the girl was sick, and now she had died. So my wife said, we'll be driving. I'm going to drive. And I had a young brother who was actually visiting. So they decided to drive all the way to Lusaka so that, you know, then we could drive together to Mansa, a place called Mansa, where that sister of mine used to live. Before they got to Lusaka, I spoke to one of the elderly people there. I wanted to just find out, would it be a good idea to just send money? Because I had been there, my wife and I had been to the place. You see, many people who leave Europe, they have uh, relatives who are ill. They can't visit them, but when they die, that is when they spend all that money. Don't waste your money. So I asked, you know, if this would be okay. And that, you know, elderly person said, yeah, that would be fine. Then I called my, my dad. Would it be okay if we just sent money? Since we were there, a few weeks ago. And my dad was happy with it. He said, you know, you will be more than helpful if you did that. After all, you came here. So when my wife arrived with my brother, I told them we will not be driving there. Now, I had an elder brother who used to work in the army as director of medical services. And uh, he was, you know, a medical doctor. And uh, so himself, 
and his wife and the driver, they were going to be driving there. So my wife said, and my young brother said, we will jump on that vehicle. We will go. And I remained in Lusaka. On Sunday, I got a message from one of the leaders in the church. They said, you know, your people who were driving to Mansa had an accident in a place called Serenge. Now I'm just thinking, what has have happened? So I quickly went to the place where my uh, brother used to live, not far from State House. And there I found somebody, an officer from the army, who confirmed that indeed there was an accident. As a matter of fact, the army had even sent a helicopter to evacuate those people from Serenge. And I'm, I'm thinking it must have been a bad accident that the army could send a helicopter. On that same Sunday, we were told the helicopter would be landing about 7 p.m. Uh, at uh, you know, one of the hospitals there in Osaka, the university teaching hospital. So we gathered by, you know, that hospital, and indeed, uh, you know, we saw two vehicles arrive. After those people were uh, gotten out of the helicopter, they were now brought by two ambulances to the university teaching hospital. In the first vehicle, there was my brother, he was hurt, he had bruises everywhere. He was quickly, you know, chair-wheeled into the hospital. Behind him, there was his wife who was in pain. She was lying in pain. I went to the next, because now I'm thinking of my wife. Where is my wife? I go to the next vehicle, and there, there is only one person behind, and that is their driver, who was lying unconscious. And there's an army officer there, and I ask, these people, when they left, there were five. What about the other two? The guy didn't know me. He just casually said, well, the other two people died. My wife had died. My young brother had died. They are traveling to attend the funeral of my sister. So three close family members in the space of one week, less than a week, they are all gone. My dear friends, in that hour, when this happened, what was it that helped me to survive? What was it that helped me to maintain my faith in that hour? It was the understanding, my dear friends, that I had read so much in the word of God that God cannot be malicious. God cannot ambush you. He can't. God is so loving that he cannot make a mistake even when I was at my lowest to the point where I did not have the capacity to pray. So saddened by what had happened. Yet, you know, God he was able to carry me through that difficult, painful process. Oh, my dear friends, when we read the word of God, it has the capacity, it has the power. But if you didn't know, if you didn't read the word of God, you would not know what God is capable of doing. The Bible itself reminds us in the book of Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 in the words of the apostle Paul, I, I have learned the secret of being content whatever the circumstances, whether well-fed or hungry. When you go to 13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So whether life is on top of the mountain. God is in it. Whether life is down in the valley of shame and pain, God is in it. But my dear friends, you will not know that God is in it if you don't take the time to read the word of God, to understand for yourself the beautiful promises that are there. You won't. Why the word of God? Oh, my dear friends, when we talk about the word of God, first of all, the word of God 
gives us an array of promises, beautiful promises. When we read the word of God, oh, the word of God as an array of teachings, it helps us to understand life as it should be lived. Oh, when you read the word of God, it is an array of admonitions, an array of warnings. It can take you back into the Old Testament. You are able to see how the people who lived at that time made their mistakes and how you can learn from those mistakes. If you don't read the Bible, you will not know. Let's conclude it this way. Let's conclude it this way. Get away from here and turn eastward. This is God's word. And hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook. And I, I, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now notice. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. That song that we sang, it says, trust and obey. The truth of the matter is that it should be obey and trust. When God speaks, the first thing you need to do is to Obey. Don't wait. There are people who will come, Pastor, you know, I'm praying that God can help me. I have this job that I am doing and I am working on the Sabbath and I'm, I have been praying. Pastor, you can also pray for me so that God can find me another thing. No, that is not how it works. In the science of salvation, leave what you are doing Obey God and begin to trust that God will be able to get you somewhere. But many people forget. They turn the whole thing around and they begin from a wrong process, from a wrong end. And they say, no, for me, first of all, God must show himself to be trustworthy. That he will find me something to do. That is when I will obey. No, the obedience must come. God has made it very, very clear. Six days you shall do your work. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On each you and all that is yours must refrain from work. Obey that thing even if it doesn't make sense to you. When you obey, you can begin to trust that the God who put it like that he will be able to help you. Now notice, notice what happens in this. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. When he did this, the Bible says, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. He didn't wait to see. He obeyed. And then he trusted. Oh, my dear friends, let me conclude this by saying, we lose so much by not finding the time to read the word of God. In this generation of social media, Facebook, people go to sleep with a phone. As they go to sleep with a phone, it is Facebook, it is WhatsApp, and all of these things, they are the ones, the last thoughts as they go to sleep are thoughts about what they read on WhatsApp, what they read and on, on, on Facebook. When they wake up, the first thing that they must pull is the phone to go to Facebook and to go to uh, WhatsApp to find out what the world is saying. Don't find out what the world is saying. First of all, find out what God is saying. Pull the Bible and get to understand the will of God before you go to what men are saying. So, my appeal to us is simply this. We who are here and those who are 
watching that we lose so much. When we don't take heed, we lose so much. God had made the statement to Adam, to Eve, don't eat. They did not take heed. They ate. This is exactly what we do. God has made so many statements and unfortunately the majority of God's people don't even know what God has said because they are not reading the Bible. My appeal to you here and to those of you who are watching, please make it your decisive decision that from now onwards through the grace of God, the Bible is going to be your book. Because it is God's book. It is the book that will guide you in life. It is the book that will help you to live the abundant life. Without it, it is not possible to live that abundant life. May the good Lord bless you and help you. I'm going to invite the choir to sing for us. Choir.
Mbuni twa wasii mumkubali yeye ali yeji toa kaibeba mizigo yenu yote Oh, oh, oh.